From an application and relevance point of view, we've been involved really since about 2005 uh, with every major epidemiological outbreak in the continental United States, supporting um, government stakeholder agencies, including the Department of Defense. Research at the Biocomplexity Institute of Virginia Tech will continue to have a significant impact at the highest levels of government as it enters into a third five-year agreement with the U.S. Defense Threat Reduction Agency for a contract known as CNIMS. We now have a synthetic population library uh, with every person on the planet in it. The contract means up to $27 million to continue building sophisticated computational modeling that already allows researchers to simulate the impact of disaster on a population anywhere in the world, helping policymakers make proactive decisions should a real-life catastrophe strike. This is a very large data integration system for complex system decision making. That's what it is. Uh, it's an example of the work we do in the Institute, but it's focused in a wonderful way by the requirements of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Their, their mission is, is uh, uh, you know, helping us deal in the world with weapons of mass destruction. It's a team approach for the next five years, built off an already successful 10-year partnership that has brought about such high-impact results as NPS-1, National Planning Scenario 1. One look at the daily bustle of our nation's capital and surrounding cities, and it's hard to imagine the unthinkable, the detonation of a nuclear device. But that's exactly the task assigned to a team of researchers at the Biocomplexity Institute of Virginia Tech. Economic processes, business processes, architecture and building, biological effects, in this particular case, nuclear weapons, how they work, what, they, what the mechanisms of destruction and, and impact are. Dr. Chris Barrett, the Institute's executive director, led the interdisciplinary team who utilized high performance computing and their diverse expertise to find answers. It's an extensive study that allows policymakers to accurately predict the best approach to rescue survivors and restore infrastructure. You know, gas flames coming out of broken pipes, live electrical wires maybe, all kinds of things. And, and there's no light, so at night it's dark. You can get hurt just trying to move. And it's not clear where you are even, that landmarks are gone. It's known as National Planning Scenario Number 1, or NPS-1 nothing is left to chance. It's a planning scenario organized to the detail. A nuclear device detonates in Washington, D.C., specifically K Street Northwest and 16th Street Northwest, not far from the White House or our nation's capital. An exact time was assigned, wind and weather recorded. The yellow you see represents the direction of the radiation after the blast. One of the things that came up in the study was to actually try and figure out how we would identify survivors because they will be interwoven with all these fatalities and injured people. Then researchers added a synthetic population. With the use of high performance computing and detailed data sources, they can run multiple simulations with an exact representation of the people who live, work, or travel through Washington, D.C. Are they parents, individuals who live alone, where do they work, live? Do they have children in daycare? What school? There are some consistent themes that come out from these uh, studies. Things like people uh, look for their family members and try to evacuate as a group. Uh, people will shelter in place if they're informed about the dangers of leaving. Uh, people will aid and assist other people. A lot of uh, Immediate search and rescue is actually carried out by survivors rather than emergency responders. Dr. Samir Swaroop researched the human behavior aspect of NPS-1. I think the unique part of the simulation was being able to model human behavior. What will people do in the immediate aftermath of such an event? The first thing is, is that we found out we would probably be able to communicate with them with, with cell phones in ways that were sort of surprising because you would think that maybe we couldn't. If we could get mobile base stations with balloons or, or on, you know, around the periphery with trucks or something. We could push emergency information. We could give them some hints about, say, what direction to go. Communication and the advancement of mobile devices can allow survivors to receive information faster, 
greatly improving the outcome of such a tragedy. The really novel part in our work was uh, um, uh, looking at the interdependencies between all these infrastructures after developing good models for them and then more crucially looking at people's behavior and how that affects these in, uh, infrastructures. A lot of studies before have done this but it's been more of a static uh, sort of analysis where they do the blast, they calculate the blast effects across the uh, city uh, and then they just make inferences about what might happen to the people there but they don't really go on in terms of the people who survive, what the aftermath looks like, and what potential immediate responses might look like. And in our particular study, we went through that extra effort. The public health impact and transportation were also big factors of the research. We looked at uh, the hospitals and what their expected uh, demands would be in terms of the number of people that might be flocking to them immediately that are injured. Uh, and then we also looked at how other responders or family members loved uh, loved ones might be responding to phone calls or text messages sent from people who are inside of the blast area and might be requesting assistance because they can't walk or they don't know where they are and they can't understand what's going on. Important factors for this study was to properly assess where people would go walk or drive and how long it would take and there would be impact of radiation some of the roads would be damaged, and we wanted to adequately capture that. This access to microbehavioral information hadn't been available in years past. We're dealing with networked systems where the networks are evolving and changing. Um, it implies certain very specific kinds of high performance computing architectures, and we've been able to build and provide those capabilities that allow us to do these studies at all, because without them, um, this would be purely sort of a conceptual framework, not something that you would actually be able to do. This kind of microscopic understanding of individual behavior combined with the intensity of computing possible at the Biocomplexity Institute of Virginia Tech allows researchers to guide emergency response at a national level should a major what-if scenario take place.